Hey guys, before we start, just wanted to say that this episode of the You Ask Me podcast is sponsored by Mudwater. Mudwater is an awesome coffee alternative that blends delicious organic ingredients such as adaptogenic mushrooms and turmeric, designed to give you a sustained energy without the jitters. Each serving of mud water comes with only one seventh the amount of caffeine that comes with coffee, so you get a focused energy boost without the crash. And if you're looking to cut back on coffee, mud water is a great alternative that is also gluten free, vegan, and keto friendly. So if you're ready to upgrade your morning, feel free to use my link and try mud water out. You'll get 15% off any new purchase that you buy. And if you decide to subscribe and get a starter kit, you'll get $20 off along with a free frother. So go ahead, try it out, ditch coffee, drink mud water. Now, back to the episode. Welcome back, everybody, to the You Ask We podcast, the show where you ask the questions, they answer them, and I'm just a guy in the middle. And this week, we have an amazing guest. She's a director and she's a choreographer. I want to give a warm, warm welcome to my good friend, Lital Mizrahi. Lital, how's it going? It's going well. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here. Yeah, thanks for being here. Uh, like, how, how's the drive here? It's good? Not bad. It's a really cool studio, and I'm excited to be on this podcast and to sit down and talk to you about my industry. That's awesome. Okay, so, yeah, I mean, you know how it is. It's like we have a lot of questions coming from different people that want to know about you and what you do and stuff like that. But the first question always comes from me. And that's, what's new with you? What's going on? What's new? Um, I'm living the post-grad life. Um, nice. A lot of people don't talk about it. It's a scary world, I think, mm -hmm. especially for creatives. What's new? I've been working on a lot of music videos lately and a lot of um, different clients. And I'm just trying to, in the midst of opening up my own production company. Nice. So that's new for sure. And yeah, I think just like continuing to make work and continuing continuing to make content and and continue my craft because I think if you don't then you you lose that creativity so just making stuff so like what steps are you taking toward that production company yeah that you're so up? um I kind of have like a crew that I work with essentially and I've built that crew throughout my college experience um in film school and basically I've reached out to different clients or clients will find me and whether it be like smaller artists that want to come out with music videos or just clients who just need maybe filmed like filmmaking content for social media um so essentially i'm just going in whether it be filming my with just me filming or bringing in a whole production crew um, but essentially just to have more to have for my production company so I kind of want to go different brackets. So it's not just like narrative short films. It's also music videos and it's also content creation, which is super in right now for, for social media and for mm -hmm. different industries. So just creating content for different type of industries. Yeah. That's awesome. That's amazing. And I mean, like, I mean, like before we even get into like what the future holds for you, it's like, let's go back to like, you know, the beginning, yeah. right? Like what got you into like acting and directing and things yeah. of that nature for sure so I grew up a dancer so I've always been in the arts mm -hmm. um and I kind of I think like junior year of high school is when you start to realize okay what am I going to do with my life um and I think there's also that pressure of like okay well you're going to go to college so you need to know what you want to study I I personally think it's a very young age to kind of know what you want to do um but for me I knew I wanted to be in the arts and Growing up a dancer, I think I saw once you get to a certain age as a dancer, it's like that's kind of it for your career, and it's the same with athletes. And and so I was like, well, I kind of want something that will take me throughout my whole journey. And so I remember I was in theater in, in high school, and I've always been in, like, music and, and theater and dance, everything creative I'm in. And so um, I was in a theater class in high school and I direct, I got the opportunity to direct a play and directing wow. for, for theater is very different than directing for film. How so? Um, I think directing for the camera is very different and actors will tell you the same thing. I mean, acting for the camera and acting for actual live performers is very different. Um, you kind of only have like a, a one shot for, for theater and, and you're performing and that's it. And versus for dance, I mean, for dance, for film, it's a little bit different in the sense of you can go back if you don't like the shot or you want to give the actor a note on a different emotion. So you kind of have more play with it. And also I personally think there's a lot more creativity bef behind the filmmaking world of directing personally. Um, Cause you work with like your DP, you work on different shots. It mm -hmm. comes also in the editing room is also a big part of directing. Um, and so I kind of knew 
from there, I like fell in love with direction and particularly directing with actors. And so I told my dad, I was like, you know, I want to go to film school. Like it was very kind of a broad, um, at the time there was only a 7% acceptance of women making it in the industry. And that's, and that's low. And, and we've definitely mm-hmm. built up, um, there's definitely more women working in film right now, but it's it's still we're still working on it for sure. And um, I remember my dad was a little bit hesitant. He wanted me to be a lawyer my whole life. Yeah. Um. I'm I'm a Leo. I'm a tough I'm a tough cookie, and I like to fight for for things. Also, classic Jewish parents. Yes, classic Jewish parents. Um. For sure, I was not going to be a doctor. Mm. Um. I loved writing, and and again, I think lawyers is also very creative in a sense. Um, you read a in lot in the arguments. Yeah, yeah, it is. You have to be. I mean, you're you're up there, and especially when you're in court, like you're literally. It's all a performance. Yeah, really. it is a performance, yeah. and and also how you're engaging with your clients too. Like you mm-hmm. have to have this sense of like okay confidence, and and also that's what we deal with as directors too. Is like I think a big thing is like coming in with with confidence on set is huge. Like, and I learned that. Like, mm-hmm. I think with my dance industry I've always been super confident and then when I got to film it was like whoa like there's people who've been working on this a lot longer they they did this in high school I didn't do this in high school and so you kind of have to grow this like confidence of of okay I need to come to set knowing exactly how it's going to work and and if something doesn't go as planned I need to know like how to adapt on the spot but you have to hold this confidence or else your crew feels that and your actors feel it Mm -hmm. and you don't get the the product that you want for sure 100 percent yeah, I actually remember like in undergrad, we had this like one course called like books on books, movies on movies. And it was like, it was a whole course talking about like, oh, like a bunch of different like books and movies talking about like their own industry. Like for, yeah, you watch Singing in the Rain, yeah. I assume. So it's like, choreograph the musical actually. Right. So, <laughs> so well, it's like, uh, Beverly, but yeah. Yeah. So it's like, I mean, like that whole thing, it's like, it's a movie about movies. Right. So it's like it was like a whole course on that. And like our midterm was basically because like our professor just went in on like different like types of shots and what they're meant to like represent. So our midterm was like a take home essay and she gave us like four shots and she was like, okay, write what these shots like mean. And it was like a still. It's like it was probably one of the most fun classes I took. Yeah, it's like you get to be creative. And it's funny because when people ask me what I do, like what a director does it's like super hard to kind of tell you what a director does because I don't think anyone will ever understand it until you're in that position. And like when I was shooting this this short film, I had my parents come on set one of the days because I was like, I need you to kind of at least see me in my element and kind of understand what I do. Like there's, um, I think we, we are portrayed a certain way as like directors in, in movies and like they cut, they call action and all this stuff, but then you realize on set that it's very different. Um, and I think like it, it's still like proving to people what I do is like I, not that I have to prove to anyone, but when you're trying to explain what a director does, it's like it's very hard to explain. Mm-hmm. It's like were there any like movies that you've ever watched that like inspired you to like make one yourself? Yeah, for sure. Or anything um, close to that. So because I'm a dancer, I fell in love with La La Land. I don't know if you've ever seen La La, oh, La Land. Oh, that's a great movie. <laughs> um, La La Land is not only I would love to direct something like that. I think that's would bring my two worlds together. Um, I just need someone to write it. I won't write that. But um, (laughs) I love La La Land also because of the cinematography. And for me, like, technical stuff is not always my forte. And and that's why I feel like I always build such a good crew and, and that communication of... I have an amazing DP who worked on my short film and and I could just, we sat there for hours and I was just explaining to him what is going on in my brain and he was able to kind of bring that to life. And I think that's super important is like, you don't have to, to be a director, like you don't have to know exactly all the settings of a camera or to shoot it yourself. But I think, I mean, it's, it's very important to know stuff, but I think that's why directors are a little bit more creative and they also work with actors a lot, which is super um, to me, I, I love working with my actors, and um, I think that also helped me growing up as an actor, too, is you know how to kind of speak to your actors, and um, La La Land, for sure, is one of my favorites. Um, I don't know if you've ever seen Brooklyn. That I have not seen. It's a good uh, It's a good movie. You should watch it. What's it about? It. Um, I won't spoil it. It's like a, like a sad... Like, I, I literally... You have to watch it. Just watch it, and then... Um, 
It's like a sadder movie, and I love crying mm. for film. Damn. Um, and what I, I love rom-coms, too. So I feel like I have, like, a very versatile, like, I don't have, like, a specific g- genre that I love. Um, I just love film. Like, I love yeah. telling stories. I also, I loved Wonder Woman just because the power behind it. Um, and I love Patty Jenkins as a director, so. That's tight. And it's, like, I feel like at the end of the day, like, in most arts, like the story by far is the most important thing. Like you can have a beautifully shot thing, but if there's no story behind it, like yeah. no one knows what the hell you're talking about. Right. Which is why, like, this is a very hot take. I really don't like Christopher Nolan. Okay. Like, I did not. I did not like Oppenheimer or the Dark Knight trilogy or like Fair. that stuff because it's like it. It, it looked nice, but yeah. it's like I was falling asleep like, for sure. in like 15 minutes. So like, that's that's sucks. the issue that I feel like we're we're now realizing is and I was talking to my actors the other day we were at a film festival and they were like they're they were like Lethal there's no like films lately have no storyline like they're just like you're watching like basically a shot list on on the screen and yeah it looks pretty or yeah this actor's in it but there's no like no sort of like feeling Mm -hmm. or emotion behind it yeah exactly so like I think we're missing that a lot and so like being able like I think film has the ability to tell so many stories and not only tell stories but also to educate and like I was I met with an actor the other day and I was talking to him and and he was saying like politicians work so hard to to get a message out Mm -hmm. and years on getting and spreading a certain awareness and we can do that within like 15 minutes of a film to like two hours we can tell a story and and educate people on certain things super fast we have the ability to do that so why wouldn't we it's also like similar to music too it's like i'm not i'm not i don't like push heavy into music by any means but i do like writing sometimes it's like really fun and it's like something that's like motivated me to write was a song like duckworth by kendrick lamar nice because like that's a whole song about like literally how kendrick like how his dad moved from Chicago to LA and like the guy who's his like main producer now mm-hmm. used to be like a gangbanger and like almost like robbed and killed Kendrick Lamar's dad. But Kendrick Lamar's dad like gave him like two extra like biscuits at a KFC that he was working at. Mm-hmm. So it's like they developed like a friendly relationship. And because of that decision, like Kendrick Lamar was like born Crazy. and like his dad didn't die. It's like, there's a whole like story behind it yeah. and it was been able to like be told in like a melodic like beautiful fashion it's like yeah, i feel I like that, that like applies like to everywhere in like yeah. arts and it's yeah like, i think that's the power of creativity is you can tell stories and like mm-hmm. you can tell a story without people even knowing like i bet you people don't even know like the meaning behind certain songs because they're just kind 100%. of like singing the song because they know the words but they don't know the meaning behind it and mm-hmm. then when you sit and you analyze something it's like whoa that mm-hmm. actually has like a meaning behind it yeah, yeah, it's it's amazing. But, you know, based on, like, all these, like, stories, yeah. could you tell us a little bit about what your story is about, Nero Chil Shabbat? Yeah. So, actually, it was my senior thesis film. Um, it was a $50,000 production, which is, is kind of a lot, money, a, a lot of money for a student film. Um, I think CSUN – I went to Cal State Northridge, and I think they're starting to um, have – their film program is starting to really go up. It's like top 20 right now, which is pretty high. That's um, awesome. Yeah, so I knew I wanted to direct a senior thesis, and the only way that you can direct is if you write the story. And I've always kind of liked writing, but writing a script is very different than just writing an essay or, or writing just to be creative. Um, and so I was struggling with what I wanted to write for a long time, and I think why I struggled is because I was writing to get chosen instead of writing from the heart. And one time I was super involved in Chabad on campus at CSUN. And um, I remember we had this huge challah baking um, at my sorority house just to kind of, it was like for non-Jewish people as well. It was just to kind of show people what, what challah baking is and, and what challah is. Mm-hmm. Um, and I remember my rabbi's wife, um, daughter came and told us a story and the story was about her great grandparents and as soon as I heard a story that story I was like oh my god that's essentially what I have to write about I'm really I stay true to my traditions and my cultures and uh, culture and I think it's it's beautiful to do so and so I kind of Nerocha Shabbat is about this two Jewish um, couple who were escaping during the Iron Curtain 
And there's a lot of stories behind it. And I say it's based on true events and not um, a true story because I changed a lot of it. And you kind of have to always do that when you're writing a script to make it more intense. And and not that it wasn't intense, but you have to kind of change things around. And so basically it follows their journey um, to kind of a better life. And in many times people had to stay true to their traditions and believe in a higher power. And essentially it follows that journey and she stays true to who she is. It follows a woman's perspective, which I think is beautiful, especially in religion. Mm -hmm. Um, And yeah, we see them kind of go through this traumatic experience trying to get to their new destination. And I don't want to also spoil it, but it's essentially kind of covers their journey to a better life. And it's crazy because I wrote this two years ago and now we're in 2024 and I couldn't say it's not more relevant than, than now. And I think I'm like super proud of of coming up and, and having all these Q&As at these festivals and being like, I think it's super important to spread this message now because this took place during the Iron Curtain and we're living in a 2024 world where we're still dealing with all this anti-Semitism. And mm-hmm. I, think, I think we have to share these films in order for people to be educated mm-hmm. on certain matters. And especially if we don't, history will repeat itself. Exactly. And, and, and also like... I like to say it doesn't just apply to Judaism. For me, it does, and that's why the, what the story is about. But I think mm-hmm. it applies to with whatever religion you believe in or whatever spirituality spirituality level you are. I think it applies to um, kind of just believing in a higher power, and and that's the beauty behind it. And I literally have people coming to me at these Q and As and and these film festivals, and they were like, wow, Judaism is such a beautiful tradi- um, s- such a beautiful culture. I didn't know this. And essentially, mm-hmm. that makes me feel really good because I'm like, this is why I wrote it, is to educate on these traditions. And if we don't pass on these traditions, our generation, then there is no one to, to pass on these stories. 100%. And and you said this was your friend's great-grandparents' story? Like so it was the rabbi's, on- rabbi's great-grandparents. Ah. Rabbi's wife's great-grandparents. And it's like, what was their, did they see the movie? Like, what was their reaction yeah, to so it? Yeah, so they actually haven't seen it yet, which is crazy. Oh, wow. Um, which I, so we just got into, I can finally say it publicly, but we just got into PBS. Um, so we're going to be screening. That's huge. Yeah, it's exciting. That's we're going to really be cool. screening it um, in September, which is really exciting. It's going to be on the TV, when, which is funny because a short film, like it's only 15 minutes and, and you mm-hmm. rarely see a short film on TV. Um, so I think it's, it's amazing, but essentially like I've kind of, we've had a lot of premieres and we had this big one with like 700 people at at a theater in Beverly Hills. And I rather people come and see my film in person and in a theater than sending it to them on the phone because I don't feel like it does it justice, honestly, like the sound system and, and just watching it on a big screen. And so all of my, it's also watching it in like a group. Yeah, exactly. And like the feeling of like being Mm -hmm. in a theater with the lights off, like it's very different. Um, and so all my festivals lately have, and these premieres have been falling on like Friday or Saturday and, and they are religious. So they, they keep Shabbat. So having them come is a little bit hard. Um, Mm -hmm. but I'm working on it for sure. Cause I think it's time that they see it. That's and, awesome. Yeah. That's I remember amazing. they saw the trailer and they were just super proud. And and it's essentially, like I said, it's it's about kind of the foundation of their story, but it's very different. So I also like to preface that. Right. For sure. And um, like when making this film, like did you have to go through casting? Yeah. What was that like? Crazy. Um, casting. So we actually got a casting director, um, which was super helpful. And she works in the industry. She kind of knows people. Not only that, but you also put it on a lot of like um, online websites and stuff. So my main actors um, were all SAG, which was essentially you have to pay them, which was good. Um, and we had the budget that allowed that. And I went through, I think, like, honestly, if you combine all my characters together, I think I went through thousands of tapes just watching with my iPad. And I know within the, like, first couple 20 seconds if if I'm going to, like, take them or not. And also some people that submitted for a certain role, I maybe took them for a different role. Um, But my main actress, Talia Martin, who plays Rivka, um, I just, I saw her tape and I immediately knew like she was, she was my character. So I think there's certain times where you're like, it'll take longer of a process. And there's certain times where you're like, okay, I, I know who, 
once you see their tape is I know who is playing this role. So, so it's like, I mean, like through those thousands of like tapes that you had to watch, like what makes an actor stand out to you? Um, I think for this particular story, it was, I was looking for something very specific. I was mm-hmm. also looking for looks because I had to, um, I think we have the ability to like change how someone looks. Um, but on a short film, I don't necessarily want to ask someone to like cut their hair or like just for, for a role and people, actors are willing to do this stuff mm-hmm. for sure. Um, but I think for sure the looks and also just, um, just seeing how I had a lot of callbacks as well. So I kind of narrowed it down from there as, as I, I looked all through my tapes and then I narrowed it down and I had callbacks and, and we just read through the script and I had them, I had also chemistry reads, which was also super important. Um, and kind of just seeing how they adapt and also take my direction. And so that's a huge thing is like, you don't want to bring on an actor who, who's, ego is too high to, to work with. And I had to deal with that for sure. Um, and as a director, you kind of have to, you're prepared in the sense of, okay, well, what, how do you direct actors? Like, Wait, were there any actors like that, like on set? Or? I did. I did have, yes, I did have like, listen, I'm, you're a young filmmaker and these people are, are older than you and, and maybe they've been working in the industry longer than you. Right. And you kind of have to be like, sometimes the way that actors take direction is not always the way that you want it to go. Mm -hmm. Um, And that's why it's super important that the way that you direct and the way that you talk to your actors is um, you, you can't, they're people and like they're people and and you have to hear them out too. And sometimes they have really good ideas, but there's a certain way you talk to, to your actors and you talk to your crew and it's very different. How, how would you talk to your actor? Yeah. um, So first of all, you never, I read a lot of books on this because I was kind of like, I wanted to be as prepared. Child actors is something so different, mm-hmm. um, which is not talked about a lot, like the way that you talk to your your child actor. And I had three three child actors. Oh, I had two child actors. Um, and so how I worked with them essentially first, it was kind of like playing like Duck Duck Goose, like literally like just trying to get them to be comfortable with me. And I wanted them to see me as like a best friend on set. And we at the end had that relationship versus when you're working with adult actors who've been working in the industry longer, it's a little bit different. I like to sit there and, and kind of have hear their backstory, how they got into, into acting and how this film applies to them. And that was the most beautiful part is to see, like, I feel like all the actors that submitted had a soft spot for my story and believed in it. And I feel like that's why I was like, okay, it was a perfect match because not only I, like there are actors who just want to like get on things to just have their face on things. But then there are actors who actually really believe in the story who want their face associated to the story because they believe it'll go places. Um, but there's, there's a whole bunch of like terminology that you use with your actors. Like you never want to like, if you don't like a take, um, you're not going to end it like cut, like change this or something like you kind of want to, it's ap- like you start with the positive. Exactly. You want to appreciate what they did beautifully. And then you, also, I, I'm a firm believer in pulling them aside and, and talking to them privately. Like, if if the take allows me to kind of go over there in between takes, otherwise I'll rely over that information to my AD, and my AD will will talk to the actors. But that's another thing. Like, the etiquette on set is super important. Like, the only person that ever talks to your actors on set while you're shooting is the director and the AD. That's pretty much it. Um, the DP, like, will rarely talk to the actors. Um and I think, yeah, just having the etiquette of, of to know how to be respectful and, and they do the same to you. 100%. So, like, speaking of takes, you know, yeah. it's, like, on average, like, how many takes would you say, like, it took to make, a, like, a scene Oof. and, like, get it right? Yeah. So, I'm huge on pre-production. Um, and some directors are not always, don't always advocate for that. I rather spend majority of my money working with the actors before getting on set because I think if you nail down like exactly what you're what you want to happen on set and then you get on set and you just film and you just shoot and you just go until you get a take that you like Mm -hmm. that flow is a lot better versus like giving them direction on set and yeah I give direction on set for sure um things come up that you maybe didn't realize during rehearsals but it takes a lot of takes and not only because of the actors, but because of 
like random the like crew. occurrences. Yeah, not only that, but also like maybe the lighting wasn't good on that shot, so you have to go again. And that's mm. why your AD is super your first AD, your first assistant director is super important because they keep you on time. Like di- as directors, you don't really worry about the time, you kind of just worry about getting the shot. Right. And that's why there's someone always kind of behind you, "Hey, we got to hurry up." Or um but I I honestly can't tell you how many how many takes. The good thing is we didn't like when I see, I'll get like one for safety, and then if I see that the first shot was beautiful and the first take was beautiful, then I'm fine moving on. And that's where I work with my scripty to kind of tell him, "Hey, I like that shot. Make sure you note that down." So when my editors go later, they kind of know which shot was my favorite. Cool. And what yeah. was your AD like? My AD was a female, which was amazing. I had a majority um, female-oriented crew, which all all three of my producers were women. Uh, my AD, she was fantastic. And then I had a second AD, too. Um, and my, yeah, she, I mean, she was super good at communicating with the, crew, with the crew. I think that's the biggest takeaway we got from being on this set is, yeah, it's a student film, but we were super professional and we worked super well as a crew. And a lot of actors told us that. And I like to stay true to that. And now working in the industry, like, I've definitely been on sets where you kind of don't feel respected um, and so I kind of, whenever I'm working on my set, I want all my crew to feel as important as the other person. Mm-hmm. And, um, communication is a, is a big one for sure. hundred percent. So like through it all, yeah. right. What would you say was your most pleasant and unpleasant moment on set? <laughs> there is a lot. So we shot on a train, which is wild. Um, the train wasn't moving. Um, I'll tell you two. I'll tell you two. Because one, one was with my film, Negocha Shabbat, and then one was um, an industry film, a uh, music video. And so mm-hmm. I think the biggest one is my one of my main actors had told my producers that he wasn't going to come the last day of filming. Like, he wasn't able to come. And he was in the scene. And I was like, what? Like, my producers didn't tell me. We were filming one of the days, and they didn't tell me until the end of that day. Haley Tall, like, we don't want you to worry about this. We'll figure it out. But this actor who plays one of the main roles can't come this day and I was like what do you mean Mm. can't come (laughs) there's only six days of shooting like there is no way we can we can change and at that that day that I think we were shooting at um PBS studios because they gave me an $18,000 grant for my film which was huge um and so we had we were working on their timeline we weren't working on our timeline and so I was kind of like oh my god what do I do like so It ended up working out because I ended up cutting that whole scene anyways because our film was over time for a short film. Um, But I think just dealing with that was crazy because he was already in the whole film. You can't, like, cast a different actor for his role all of a sudden. Mm -hmm. So I think dealing with that was was crazy. Um, I think shooting on a train had its ups and downs for sure. We had to make it look like it was moving because it wasn't moving. Mm. Um, That's where my DP came in and blowed us all away with that uh but i think that was my biggest one on on negocio shabbat it went really smoothly honestly really smoothly um and then i think working in the industry i was working for an artist i won't say who it is um because <laughs> of nda purposes but um we were there for i was there 8 a.m was my call time and i was there all the way until 8 a.m the next day so Jeez. that's like unheard of um not unheard of, but I never in my life pulled an all-nighter until I got to that set. It's like, what did you even do for that? Like, I mean, like, whatever you're yeah. allowed to say. I'm not trying to pry. Do for but that like, in what sense? Like, what was your job on that music Oh, so video? I was working a PA. I was working as a PA on that one. Um, and so they finally got to the point where we were like, okay, well, we got to switch out our crew because these people need to sleep. I remember like I drove home, like literally almost crashed into a car because I was so oh exhausted. Um, and and you know why we ran into that issue is just there's just some artists who like it their their way or the highway. And and that's also something you have to deal with is is actors with egos and, and bratty artists. Um, and it's also very nice to see certain artists that have like a big name appreciate you and and like whether that be as a PA or a director's assistant every position um I think that's like there are some amazing actors who will like 
go around and, and tell you thank you at the end of it. And, and that's like super, it makes it super worth it for sure. Cause I think uh, there's not a lot of light shed on the people behind the cameras all mm -hmm. the time. So hundred percent. And it's like, I mean like moving back to like Noel Chil Shabbat, right? Yeah. Cause it's like, you were talking about how um, it's gotten to like festivals and things like that. Did you submit it to these festivals yourself? Like how, how does it work yeah. with those? So um, my producers usually will deal with all the logistics of that. Um, we set aside a couple thousand for film festivals. Film festivals are expensive and- Like you have to pay to like get it in. Well, you have to pay to submit to even have wow. the, yeah, have even option to, to get into it. And there are certain regulations with certain festivals like PBS, I wasn't allowed to tell anyone that we got in as a finalist until just now where they pub publicized it. So now we can share the wow. word. Um, but then there's also festivals where they don't want your film publicly out until they screen it. And so you kind of have to um, look at which which festival you really want to get into and, and how what benefits are you going to get out of it. Luckily, we've we also submitted for a lot of smaller festivals, which I which I'm super thankful for. Um, and then we got into a lot of these bigger festivals. But essentially, my producer kind of helped me submit. And you don't just submit your film; you submit maybe like a backstory on the the director and why you wrote the film and how many crew members, blah blah blah, all the logistics behind the film. And then you wait a long time, and then Jeez. you hear back. And that's the best part is just like I have this. It's called Film Freeway where we've been applying and, and it's beautiful to see all these, oh, selected, selected, selected. Like you just go down and it's um, luckily like very few we haven't gotten into. Um, and I've set aside some more money because I think there's, we still have a long way to go for sure. Like what were the few festivals that like you got selected for and like you didn't even like think that you would come anywhere close to it? Yeah, I mean PBS for sure is a huge one. Right. Um, just because it's it's a name. Um, what else we got into, we're still waiting to hear back from like the big, big ones. Um, but we got into a lot of female festivals, which is really nice because we have the advantage of, of submitting for those. Um, oh my God, I like having Radford CBS under our name is also huge because people see the name. Um, Wow, I don't even know all the festivals. Like, I can't, I literally can't even tell you the names of the festivals. Cause <laughs> I'm like, I go to these festivals, like, knowing kind of what we're getting ourselves into. And then I, like, get to a point where I'm, like, socially drained of, like, networking, <laughs> yeah. which is probably not good. But, um, yeah, it feels like a little bit, I, I'm, what I like to say is I'm super ready for the next film. And, like, that's where kind of. I am now is like what's next for me because once you see your film so many times like I've literally seen my film I think like uh, like <laughs> during the editing process way too many times and and that's what's super hard as a director too is you kind of have to sometimes take like a step back and and not look at your film for a little bit and then go back and like be in like, order to keep the same passion yeah exactly because you're like ugh, mm. I'm tired of it yeah. and like it shouldn't be that way like it should be wow I just created a a beautiful thing that's honestly me rewatching these episodes sometimes yeah exactly like i'm just like <laughs> i'm so tired of this yeah legal. <laughs> but that's why it's like it's also nice to spin it up with different different um you bring different people on here with yeah. different industries and that's why i'm like okay well now it's time for the next film if that makes sense and that's why i've been mm -hmm. going into music videos a little bit is because right. i have a huge passion for that and so now i'm like switching into kind of i still want to go into short films and eventually feature films and um, you'll see my name on the big screen one day, but God willing. Yeah. Hey. And it's like, I mean, how do, how do those music videos like compare to like the cinema work? Yeah. It's very different also. Um, I think in our generation we have, there's a power for short term, uh, short form content right now. There's a huge, um, demand, whether that be on TikTok or Instagram reels, mm -hmm. like I just feel like people are watching that more than they're maybe watching cinema. Like, that's the truth. Like, how often are people going to, to a movie theater or watching an actual film? And I find myself, like, sometimes I'm like, okay, if I have, like, let's say an hour of free time before bed, I'm like, I'd rather just scroll on TikTok than, like, sit down and watch a film, which is crazy. Like, why are we saying that? Because film has way more of a storyline. So that's where I'm like, okay, well, I think music videos and specifically, like, um, content videos 
have the ability to also tell stories. I think mm -hmm. it depends on which artist you're working with and, and what they want their music video to be. But I think you can tell a story within two minutes of a music video. And um, music videos, are for, for me, are, are more fun in the sense of, like, you can be more quirky, you can be more creative, you can be more fun. Like, you can do whatever you want. Yeah, exactly. And I feel mm -hmm. like sometimes with a short film, it's, like, a narrative. It depends on the short film you're doing. But right. I think there's more of a narrative, and you're working with your actors, and you don't work that much with actors on a music video unless, unless there's a storyline behind it. But mm -hmm. um, I think... It's really fun being on a, on a music video set for sure. It's like, is there a specific like musician you'd like dream of working with like at some point, like on their music video? Yeah, for sure. Um, so Charlie XCX just came out with like the whole Brat mm. album, um, which I actually was working with a client. We are delivering, hopefully next week it'll come out, but we came out with a dance concept video for her song. Um, and so essentially like that's kind of also why I'm opening up a production company is I kind of want to show artists, Hey, like we have the crew, we have the talent to, to make it happen for you. Cause there are also a lot of artists who don't want to be in their music videos. Um, and I think we take advantage of that as well. Mm -hmm. Um, but I'd love to work for her and, and essentially i I mean, one day JLo would be a dream that for would be tight. sure. That's pretty cool. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean. Love Jenny from the Bronx. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, moving on, like, um, we're kind of nearing the end of this. Um, so like kind of bringing it back to the beginning where yeah. we were talking about like, Oh, like your dad said, be a lawyer and you wanted to go more into the arts. Yeah. Do you ever sometimes get worried about the fact that you're not doing like a conventional job? Yeah. I mean, listen, like I was talking to my brother about this the other day, like working as a creative and not just a filmmaker, like anything in the arts, mm -hmm. I think there's no conventional way of getting into it. Like, there are also a lot of actors who be like, oh, I wasn't planning on being an actor, and now I'm here, you know? Like, and there's also a lot of filmmakers like that. Um, and so sometimes you, there is this, like, I think also being a female, too, is, like, you have this pressure, and I felt this a lot with Nogotsu Shabbat, is, like, I had this pressure of, like, women are still making, like, coming to people are starting to realize that women can finally do what men do. And this industry is, is run by men a lot of the time. Mm -hmm. And so um, kind of like a conventional job of being a director, there is no conventional job. And so you kind of have to, I felt like I always had to um, like prove myself. Right. And that's hard. Like, because you're more stressed about, Oh, am I like doing a conventional job versus mm -hmm. let me make the film, you know, like let me kind of just, Right. have my talent and and show my work you know and i also feel like that kind of just comes with having a chip on your shoulder yeah in general like yeah. regardless of all that stuff like i mean obviously it's like it's a big thing like to be a woman in media and stuff yeah. like that but it's also like us being jews like more specifically like middle eastern jews yeah. like growing up with parents that are like the only way to succeed is being a doctor or yeah. lawyer right yeah and like my thing is like i want to go into sports law and like, even though that's being a lawyer, that's not a conventional lawyer. Cause it's like, you bring that up to anyone and they're just like, oh, why don't you do PI? Like yeah. that makes good money, yeah. right? But it's that, like, but that's the thing is like, that's I want to do makes, what I want. Exactly. Do. That's what makes good money or that's what like you should be doing. But like, why? That's not me. Like, and, and that's, that's like the beauty of, we get to write our story for our life and 100%. so like you got to go after what you want to do and yeah mm -hmm. I think there is some guidance in saying hey that's maybe not the industry that will ever kind of pay the bills like and that's true like you really do have to think about that is like paying the bills and also doing what you love and so sometimes you kind of have to um not in a way compromise but you have to like go around and figure out what the best path for you is mm -hmm. um but yeah conventional like there is no conventional way of getting into anything in the arts i think like for a lawyer you go to school and you pass the bar, the bar. and there you are you know yeah. and like and it's the same thing with my brother who's an engineer it's like he graduated and he got a job straight after college and he's been working there ever since and yeah he'll go to different companies but you're kind of you're you're fine like your, right. your life is is kind of set and for people in film like it's not like that it's a lottery exactly it's mm -hmm. it's working the freelance life for sure Mm -hmm. Um, and so it's kind of navigating and being like, 
giving also yourself a pat on the back and being like, dang, I came this far and, and look, I still have a long way to go. And I'm still dealing with that. And I talk, and I'm super hard on myself. And that's just like being a dancer is, is I always feel like what I did was not good enough and it could always be better. And Mm -hmm. that pushes me to create better things, but it's also sometimes you have to take a step back and be like, Hey, that was, that was really good. Like, good job. Now, now is the next one, you know? Mm -hmm. So yeah, there's no conventional way of doing it. At I, just, all. I don't think there's any conventional way to success. No. It all just comes somehow. Yeah. Some way. I think you have to let your life run its course, but you also have to navigate it in the right direction. Mm-hmm. And so um, that's why like having, I love to sit down with professionals like who work in the industry and be like, hey, like what did your life kind of, how did you get into this? Because everyone has a different story. And I really think that like listening to people listening to people's advice, which is literally what you're doing on this show. And just like how they got there is like huge because everyone does it in a different way. So just like Mm -hmm. being able to sit down and listen to people and listen to people's stories, I think is beautiful. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for that. Yeah. But (laughs) yeah, I mean, based off everything, you know, the way the show works is the first question comes from me. And the last question also always comes from me. Yeah. And that's if you had to give one piece of advice, you know, to the people watching at home, uh what would you tell them yeah I mean I think I touched upon it a little bit but I think really it's about following what you want to do in your life and no one can tell you how that's gonna look and what's meant to be will be but I do think that if you have a passion for something go after it and I know that sounds super cliche but it's really true because you're living the rest of your life. You have to be happy doing what you're doing. Mm -hmm. Working, like for me personally, working a nine to five is not something that I could ever see myself doing because that's not who I am. Like I feel like I I need to be creative. And so I think following your dreams and um, creating that foundation of support behind you is is the biggest piece of advice I can say. Follow your dreams. (laughs) <laughs> follow your dreams ladies and gentlemen <laughs> Lital, thank you so so much for coming on yeah. it was awesome i really appreciate it if you guys like this episode please make sure to like and subscribe if you guys want to see what's going on with the show who's coming on next all my socials all my socials are going to be down below as well and if you want to see what's going on with Lital, what's coming up next for her her links are going to be down below as well and with that this has been the us we podcast my name is ed in toronto and i'll see you guys next week yeah